So good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Mad Ventures Lecture Series. Uh, our speaker today comes from the art and design worlds, uh, the world of making things much more prettier and uh, uh, more user friendly. Gillette Choham is a seasoned uh, uh, product developer and inventor uh, uh, with uh, extensive experience for designing healthcare products. Gillette will be walking us today through the industrial design process and we'll be using a case study to kind of show us how you could translate user requirements into successful products and how industrial design uh, uh, can actually unlock opportunities of innovation for medical devices. Uh, Gillette is the chief industrial and mechanical designer at FIO Corporation, developing next generation point of care infectious disease diagnostic devices. He's also the teacher of healthcare product design at the undergraduate and graduate level at OCAD University. His design career includes Sunnybrook Center for Studies in Aging, Consumer Goods Innovator Umbra, and as a founding partner at Medonix, where he created and licensed novel disposable infection control products incorporated into government stockpiles and to customers worldwide. Responsible for designing 200 plus products, Gillette studied industrial design at Rhode Island School of Design. He's a gold and silver medal recipient in the National Post Design Exchange Awards and was the first winner on CBC Dragon's Den for his invention of Medonic's gel fast hand hygiene system. He has numerous medical device patents awarded uh, or pending in the US and worldwide. Gillette, thank you so much for uh, being our guest lecturer. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Hi everyone, uh, you can hear me, you can see me. Okay, great. So, uh, so that sounds like a, a pretty interesting lecture to, uh, to, to hear about. Um, so what I'm gonna talk to you about today is uh, user requirements and how they make their way into products for better or worse. Um, so let's start out with, uh, oh yeah, I should probably be over here. Okay, so I'm gonna, Fast forward a little bit on this. Uh, um, I was the first. Uh, it was the first day of filming ever on Dragon's Den, uh, season one. This is a long time ago, and uh, they had already seen I think like seventeen different companies that day, and none of them went forward. We were actually the first deal, so I'm, I'm giving away the uh, the plot here. Uh, there was actually a bidding war between the uh, the various investors, and you know they they I actually came out with more. Uh, more than I came in asking for because they, they outbid each other. So that's really cool. Um, why did I drive here in a Jetta and not in a Lamborghini? Um, so this is this is the product uh, that I'm talking about here, Gelfest Anywhere, and it's you, you saw the you saw the shtick. It's a wearable uh, spritz uh, of alcohol gel. This failed miserably in the market. Failed absolutely miserably. Um, even though it won on here, people were really excited about it. The idea makes a lot of sense. Uh, it won design awards. You know, I was asked to be, like it won enough design awards that I was asked to be a judge for other design competitions. And it absolutely failed miserably because I didn't do a good job on user requirements. So, and that's what I want to talk to you about today is, uh, is user requirements and how, how we can get them in a, a, a few different methods of getting uh, user requirements, why it's really important. Like I started a business around this and, you know, got investors and created a company and because the user requirements weren't gathered well, that's why it, uh, it didn't work. So, um, let me tell you why that, uh, so the, the genesis of this idea is I, you may have, uh, captured my, uh, I have a brother who is a doctor of infectious diseases, and he said, hey, we've got this real problem, hand hygiene, and, you know, I'm a product designer, and so I, I was in, intrigued in this problem. I said, you know, I think design could help solve hand hygiene, uh, and I'm a product person, so I, I thought, you know, why don't we put alcohol gel on the, uh, on the user, and that makes a lot of sense. You know, if you don't have to go to a sink and wash your hands over there, or you don't have to go to a wall-mounted dispenser, uh, and, uh, you know, you've just got it on you, you go from patient to patient, click, 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 nice and easy. So, you know, went and started building prototypes and building, uh, you know, working prototypes and started to get some money from various investors and actually built tooling and, you know, went into production. Um, what, what I missed was this user requirement, was this user, user requirement gathering step, which is, Who's going to be the user? So 
my world, I'm a product designer. So my world is spent with a lot of manufacturers and it's spent, you know, in front of CAD systems and drawing and tooling and that kind of thing. It's not really spent in front of uh, uh, healthcare workers. It's not really spent in front of, uh, of patients. So I had to use a lot of imagination for what my users were like. And, you know, I, I did some investigation uh, in the field, but I skimped on it. And because I product people can have a tendency to jump into product development prematurely. So it turns out that it isn't really doctors and nurses that are doing the, the primary touching of patients. It turns out that it's the, the, the touching element uh, from a, a frequency point of view, it's really nurses are the ones who are doing the, the heavy duty touching of patients uh, day in, day out, a lot more so than, uh, than doctors. And in general, gender differences don't matter in product design, except in the sometimes cases where they do. And so there are a lot of similarities between the two genders, but it, it turns out that nursing has a very high proportion of women to men uh, compared to uh, some other fields. And within that, there's a fashion difference. Women have a tendency to dress a little bit differently than men, and usually it doesn't matter, except when it does, and this is one of those cases. So, uh, and, uh, so what we found, uh, as I was developing it, I said, you know, I'm sorry for the webcam, if people can't see me, I'm, you're probably like, get back into the webcam. Um, but, uh, <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so, when I developed this, I said, okay, well, it, the, the benefits of this gadget are so good, the high, hand hygiene benefits are so high that, of course, if somebody has their shirt untucked, then the benefits clearly outweigh the, uh, the, the uh, you know, just basically tucking your shirt. Not a big deal. Turned out that tucking in your shirt was a really big deal. And we had a lot of problems in getting, uh, especially, female nurses to tuck in their shirts. And you know, we, we wouldn't really say you have to wear your shirt tucked in, but practically speaking, the product is totally useless if your shirt's untucked. So it's, if uh, today me could go back in time to with hair on head me and say, just make sure it works with untucked shirts as well as it does with tucked, uh, because we have this gender fashion issue that's gonna kill you, um, you know, Lots of things would be different, and my, my car outside might be a, a, a little fancier. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, that was the uh, gel fast experience in, in a nutshell. Um, okay, let me see if I can. Uh, so what I learned from this is that we really have to do a, a user-centered design process. And I'm, I'm not gonna bore you with like a ton of slides of, uh, of you know, dry, super dry stuff, but you know, basically there, there are a lot of different ways to approach a product development. Uh, and you know, one of them, it's, it's very simple, it's called 5D. And you just go through the, the process, discover, define, design, develop, deliver. The, the software world does this all the time. In, in reality, you know, even though we give each one the same size D, it's more like discover, define, design, and then develop is like takes, you know, the, the project that I'm working on now, I've been working on for about three years in this last, you know, big develop portion. Um, but in this process, uh, so the, the, the first of these Ds that I think about is, uh, is discover. And within this first step, you know, we're, we're discovering in industrial design, you know, the, the questions that writers are asking, who, what, when, where, why, how. Uh, so we're, we're asking, who are these people? And, you know, hopefully you can memorize all of this very quickly because I'm not going to go through all of these. Uh, but, you know, th these are basic questions, but it's something as simple as who. You saw on the, on the Gelfast Anywhere product, which looks so cool, the who question has serious implications to it and, was, you know, is the difference between make or break on that particular product. Um, so as you begin a design pro as you begin to design your product, you really have to go through these different questions in your own mind, uh, and, and not just gloss over them. So who is not healthcare workers? That's, that's surface. Now you have to go deeper. Which kind of healthcare workers? Are they 
doctors? Are they nurses? What kind of doctors? What kind of nurses? Is it, you know, et cetera. So the, the deeper you can get into this discovery phase, the higher quality your product is going to be because once you know who, what the environment is that you're designing for, then you switch over into define and you'll notice that discover and define are very similar. Uh, they have these, you know, a, a lot of the same questions, uh, only now instead of asking who is our user, we're going to ask who should our user be because we can, you know, now we're flipping over into a design mode and we can start to steer the conversation and steer the, the product development to where we want to go rather than just taking a snapshot of an existing environment. So once we start to filter all of this uh, uh, data down, then the design almost designs itself. It's like if you can load up your brain with all of this data from, uh, from the field and from, from looking at customers and from looking at the landscape uh, and, and articulating the problem that you want to solve really, really well, the design can sometimes almost, almost design itself. Um, so now that's, so I'm, I'm going to show you an example of that. So fresh off the heels of, uh, of this very high profile success to everybody else, except for those in the know who knew that it was a fiasco project, we were asked by a group of hospitals um, to, uh, to come up with some new PPE, some new personal protective equipment, uh, specifically a, uh, a disposable face shield. Um, so let me go into... Um, Where do, where do these products come from? Where do, where do better products come from? Um, where are you getting this information? You know, because I'm, I'm this product designer and I'm really familiar and comfortable with machinery and, and that kind of thing. Um, but to, to make a, you know, I can't just walk into a hospital and, and find some solution, uh, find some great problem. Really, a, a great problem is, uh, is the core of a lot of what, uh, of coming out with a good product. So, I've found that when a customer who knows their, their internal landscape really well comes together with somebody who knows a lot about manufacturing, that's when a really cool, that's such a dorky drawing. Okay, sorry. That's when a, uh, uh, that's when a really good product can, can come about because, you know, coming up, having a deep knowledge of manufacturing, it's, it's kind of like a lifetime of, of experience. Like I, I've been at it for 20 years and I, I can, work my way around factories and stuff, but I have not been inside hospitals for 20 years. Uh, so, and working with other people who have that level of expertise in that environment uh, really is, is beneficial um, and can lead to really great products. For instance, let's talk about Better Shield. So a group of hospitals approached me and said, um, hey, we hear you're pretty handy with plastics. Uh, we have this problem with disposable face shields. And I, I think I was like yawning or something. I said, okay, well, you know, we, we all have problems, but what's, uh, what's uh, just like you did. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, so what's, what's the, you know, we all have problems. And they said, yeah, but our, our problem has a, a pandemic stockpile that needs to be filled. And, uh, you know, at which point I'm like a little greedy. So I said, okay, well, that, now, now I'm interested. Um, so they, uh, the problem is that, the current disposable face shields that existed at this time really sucked. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you an example. So this is a disposable face shield. Uh, and it's basically a clear piece of plastic with a thing of foam on your head and then a rubber band. That's it. And this is meant, you know, as a uh, patient walks into an ER or into, a, you know, into any environment where you need facial protection, healthcare worker puts this on uh, and it shields their eyes and their mucous membranes. Um, and when you do a, a survey of the market, uh, these are, these are all models down here. I think um, the, the various different companies that sell these products, they all look pretty much the same and they actually all have nearly identical product flaws. Uh, so yeah, they, I mean, this is the, the level of variation that you see with them. Why does this matter? Let me see what the, uh, okay, so let, let me just talk about the first big problem. 
the person who came to me with this problem, uh, the, the head of this hospital group, uh, this head of this uh, hospital purchasing group who wanted these disposable face shields, she used to be uh, a, a frontline worker during SARS. And during the SARS outbreak, she was wearing a disposable face shield and she went over to uh, tend to a patient. And now you'll, you'll notice that uh, either this is really short and you, know, you can imagine a patient is down here if you can see my mouse, uh, a patient is down here. So they're, you know, coughing and spewing, and that would just go right under here. So generally, uh, hospitals are using quite long face shields. Now, th that's great. It gives good protection. But what she was doing was moving her arm across her face to adjust some knob or dial on a, on a monitor. This shield, not this particular one. I don't know what brand it is. Uh, the, the shield that she was wearing, slid off her face, so gave her a full exposed face. The patient saw this as a great opportunity to cough and sneeze like SARS juices into her face, and she actually contracted SARS, uh, which, like, that's, that's a big deal, you know, it's on, uh, obviously. Um, on, the, you know, on the news every day during the SARS crisis, uh, there was, like, a group of grown-ups behind the, uh, you know, saying, we have this thing under control, and, you know, all precautions are being taken. And then one of the people who was, you know, talking is now contracting SARS, and she's now giving uh, uh, interviews from her isolation tent in her living room. So she recovered, thankfully. She got better. Uh, and, you know, fast forward a, a lot of years, and then she was asked to uh, head this group to do procurement for these disposable face shields. And she said, oh my God, I will not be buying like hundreds of thousands of this thing that almost killed me. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the alternatives were basically identical. They all had the same problem. So she came to me uh, and this group came to me and said, um, there are a lot of problems with these shields, and we want uh, we want something better. Um, so, uh, you know, and I, I won't go over all of the problems with them because, you know, that was the, the big problem is that, you know, she was wearing it and she got SARS. So that's like sort of high on the list. But then, you know, as you start to investigate it further, there are like a laundry list of other, other problems with it. Um, so... Fresh off, you know, off the heels of my um, understanding that my previous big product did not succeed because I didn't understand user requirements, uh, I, I learned my lesson hard. And this product I was convinced was going to be a, a success because I was going to listen uh, and understand my users inside and out beforehand. Also, an, a neat thing happened. Uh, so this group of, of hospitals said, you know, what why don't you go develop this thing and then, you know, go, go and do your R and D and then come back to us. And if we like it, we'll buy it. And so it, developing products is like really expensive. And I had a startup and, you know, a fairly low head count. So going off on an adventure to, to design something, you know, for like hundred very small companies. So I could do it for hundreds of thousands of dollars, but still, developing something for hundreds of thousands of dollars and then you go up to a, a customer and they and you say here here it is what do you think of it i've had this happen in the past where they say it's really nice but budgets are tight this cycle and you know i wish you'd talk to us like six months ago or maybe come back in six months from now or 12 months or that person's no longer there because they they've moved up in their career or for myriad reasons i did not want that to happen either because that that could sink me. Uh, so came up with an interesting uh, and innovative sort of Kickstarter-ish way of doing it, where I said, okay, how about this? Um, I'll, I'll do some sketches. I'll do some kind of general product concepts that will solve all of your problems. And then if you promise to buy it, if it's better, then I'll promise to develop it. And and they said, that's, that's kind of whacked out. Um, but... Uh, Okay, so so what you're saying is you promise to develop it better, and then if it's actually better, then we have to promise to buy it today, right? Uh, and you know there is a, I'm, I'm sort of fast forwarding the negotiation because if it sounds like that was a, a fast and easy negotiation, you know it, it wasn't. Um, but when when they were on the hook 
So I said, they were now on the hook that they actually had to buy this thing. And I, I'm not trying to regale you with stories of like business deals, but here's why that's important. When they were on the hook to buy it, if it were better, then they said, okay, hang on a second. If we promise to buy it, then it really has to be better. And here's what it really needs to do. And at this point, our customers became really engaged with identifying what makes a better shield. So they identified, and we, we kind of together identified these factors. So they said, it, it has to be more comfortable. It has to have greater stability. It has to have you know, clarity of vision, uh, you know, and all of these uh, different elements. These are the ones that we kind of identified together that if we could actually improve these measurably, then contractually they would, you know, they would basically uh, execute a PO. So these are our requirements over here that came from our customer. And what's neat is that, um, did you see that? That's kind of a cool little, okay. So this is, this is the user feedback form. So what we, what we decided to do is, um, actually, let me tell you a, 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 a little story. Um, so this was going to be a, an evaluation uh, where users would try out the product for X number of weeks. Um, and these would be, you know, real healthcare workers in clinical environments. And they would use hours. They would rate it on comfort from, you know, uh, yeah, this is super duper comfortable to, oh, my God, scratch my eyeballs out. Horrible. Um, you know, and it's, it's called a Likert scale. It's a, a very simple method of giving numbers uh, of quantifying qualitative data. Um, so it just converts people's opinions into spreadsheets, basically. Um, so, uh, you know, these are, these are all of the, uh, the factors that they felt were going to be important to the success of this product. Uh, so one of the neat things about this, uh, the, the way this study was done was that, um, in the past I have been involved in the, like for, for the gel fest anywhere product for, for, for this guy. Um, I had been involved in these studies, uh, myself and, you know, so showed it to, to healthcare workers and showed it to management and said, what do you think? You know, would you try it? Would you like it? Would you buy it? And they said, absolutely. And that's great. And then when it came down to it, it they didn't, they didn't do it. You know, they said budgets have changed or problems uh, or et cetera. And the, the hard lesson that I learned on that was that designers uh, and the people who are behind the products can sometimes have this halo effect that people don't necessarily like the product. They really like you, or maybe not even you. They just like your energy. And, and that really sways people's opinions while you're nearby. But the moment you go away, a day or two or a month later, and the product is on its own, and it has to stand on its own two feet, and you're no longer there to, to provide your haloing energy, then that's when the product really has to stand on its own. And if it's not a solid product, then it's going to fall apart. So I was, I was uh, very concerned and convinced that I would not do the same thing with the face shield. So in this one, during the trials, I actually got out of town. Uh, you know, I, I left Toronto. Not, not that I think I have a powerful enough halo that, you know, I can be in the same city. No, it's, it's that uh, I, I was actually really nervous. Uh, so I, I, I got out of town. Um, but, uh, but it's very important for a, a study of the product to be done without the people who are invested in it. And this is kind of basic science uh, stuff, but as a designer coming from an arts background, this is a, a little bit of a, a hard lesson that I learned. So another thing that I learned was that, so this, this is a, a big glossy boardroom, boardroom table. And the users of the face shield in this case, or the users of a product, it isn't just the actual touching people uh, who are the users. It's the stakeholders uh, that are really important. And, and I learned this the hard way because sometimes we had with the gel fest product, we had people who really liked using the product, but other people in the hospital ecosystem and the buying ecosystem would kibosh it, would kill it. And you know, like sometimes it was purchasing, sometimes it was, uh, logistics. Something. Um, and so 
I, I started to develop this mental model of this boardroom table. Now, the term stakeholder is one of these like businessy jargon terms that has never really meant that much to me, except when it cost me a lot of money. Um, it, in what I think about is the boardroom table. So the boardroom table is an interesting place because as you go in to sell your idea, you, you have an idea, you have an innovation, you have a new gadget, a gizmo, a, a solution, and you go and give that presentation in front of this glossy table at Myriad hospitals or facilities around the world. There are representatives sitting all around this table. Each of these seats is populated by a different person. And what I've found is that no one person around that table has green light authority. Can't, no one person can absolutely make it happen. However, every single person around this table can veto. So your idea is working its way from, you know, the nurse to the nurse manager to the doctors to the, you know, administrator to purchasing says, or, you know, some other role, some other stakeholder says no. And then, and then it's, uh, it's killed. So it's very important that everybody around that table is on side with what you're talking about. Now, it's hard enough to get expertise in just manufacturing or just design or just the, you know, in, in, uh, in just, you know, the world of the nurse or even maybe the world of the nurse and the nurse manager or, you know, like two or three or four of these seats. But it's almost impossible to have full expertise in all of these. Um, you know, that's uh, bigger organizations actually can, but small organizations really struggle with uh, with building that kind of depth of expertise. So the, the best I could hope for is I tried to give everybody around this table something, a, a cookie, a crumb. You know, some, some people, uh, some stakeholders, the idea was to give them a lot, and, and they're the ones that are driving the thing. So, you know, nurses are in, or doctors would be into not getting SARS, for instance. That's a, that's a cool thing. Um, but purchasing, eh, you know, they're... Frankly, their needle doesn't move too much one way or the other, like when it just comes down to how they get promoted or, uh, or you know, uh, like how they get rewarded in their job. Really, it, it's purchasing decisions. Um, you know, and logistics guy is the same, and sometimes there's even like a janitor, like maintenance facility people sitting there. Um, so you have to think about at least giving a cookie to each of those. Uh, you know, and when I say a cookie, like a uh, some sort of something in the, uh, in the product that lets them either green light it through them or it or better yet accelerate it uh, across their uh, across their desk so let's talk about purchasing for a second because they they really like price um this is a, a little bit of a tangent but it's fun so lamborghini remember i do not have one of these um this guy cost uh, about a hundred million dollars to, uh, to develop and they cost about a quarter of a million bucks versus the Gillette Mach 3 razor, which costs about a billion dollars to develop, and they cost like 250 a razor blade. So the, yes, this razor blade cost four times more, or I'm sorry, 10 times more on the, uh, on the R&D budget to develop than a Lamborghini. And so that's, it. Uh, for those who know about manufacturing or economies of scale, it makes a lot of sense because you know the Mach 3 blade, is uh, you know it's all automated robotics. Uh, there are barely any people in the factory. It's all like automated uh, ro uh, like mobile robots that bring things from cell to cell. Whereas the Lamborghini has like Luigi, who's sewing the beautiful leather saddle seat. And you know if if you want the quality to be like that, you say Luigi. Come on, and he says. <laughs> and, um, so. And, and that's, it's a lot cheaper to talk to Luigi than to, you know, build robotic cells. Um, so, however, one of, the, uh, one of the important parts for the disposable face shield was, going back to this boardroom table, one of the mistakes I had made in the past was to make our product too expensive because I said, hey, it's going to save lives. Money is, uh, I wouldn't say not, not an object, but let's, you know, do some fun, fun calculations on how much lives are worth. And then we'll talk to financing about how much this is cheaper than, you know, all the lives that you could have killed otherwise in hand hygiene. Yeah, that, that argument didn't, didn't go so well. So when asked for the better shield project, uh, for the face shield project, how much does it cost? I've been through this before. I've been through the finance people before. I said, it costs a penny less than what you're paying now. So I, I, 
don't know what you're paying now, but I can tell you that whatever it is, we're gonna do it for a penny less because that way it's not gonna stumble at your desk anymore. It's not gonna stumble at your, at your boardroom seat. It's just gonna get the green light through. So when I found out how much it actually cost, uh, I took a really deep gulp because uh, it, it's like really cheap. Um, and so that, that suddenly became like very, very difficult to match the price of what existed on the market and yet come out with a much better product. Because remember, I had to solve all of these problems. I had to make it better for comfort, for stability, for anti-fogging, for, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I also had to make it better on price. And um, had I simply uh, ignored that and just gone and developed better, 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 except not really kept price in mind, then I probably would have come to market with something that was a lot better, but really expensive. And then I'd be fighting this really hard battle that I've fought before and I've lost, saying it's so much better, but you know it's more expensive. Um, so because I had a price target down to the penny before I started, I knew that I, I had to hit this target or else it was going to be a kind of, it was going to be a really tough, it would be pushing string in the marketplace. Uh, I had to invent manufacturing technologies to hit that price. Um, and that's, that was kind of wild. I, I didn't really want to invent manufacturing technologies, but to make it, you know, and I won't go into like too much detail on the, on the technologies, but it is pretty cool. It's like high speed, thin film, optical uh, thermoforming, which didn't exist at that point. Um, so after class, if anybody's interested and wants to geek out, I'll tell you more about it. Uh, but you know, that was, that was an innovation caused by a deeper understanding of, uh, of what the market wanted. So now let me, uh, just go over here. No, don't not. Thank you for your time. You're so not done yet. Um, okay. So. All right, so after all of those user requirements had kind of filtered into my brain and a, and a colleague of mine, so we're both designers, um, this came out and it's called Better Shield. And yes, I recognize this content. Okay, so uh, you know, without getting into, again, too many of the details, here's one of the main differences. Uh, here's a, a typical uh, face shield side view. Here's your patient lying on a bed. You, you notice something over here, right? Better Shield tucks underneath the chin. Okay, pretty simple. So making it kind of make that uh, that little turn is a, it turns out to be a really big deal, um, and wickedly hard to manufacture unless you invent this manufacturing process. Um, we found out that uh, you know people have a lot of different head sizes and face shapes, and uh, so there are uh, especially in Toronto, it's really cool. We have a huge diversity of hair. Of, uh, we have a huge diversity of uh, different ethnicities and uh, different genders. Uh, well, there aren't that many genders, but we have a lot of, a lot of uh, ethnic diversity in Toronto. And there's a lot of craniofacial differences, which are, which are cool. Um, so, uh, which you might not know had you developed this in a more ethnically homogenous place. So I teamed up with a, uh, with a, a guy who is sort of a craniofacial uh, uh, data set analyzer. Um, so he designed a lot of bicycle helmets in the past. So anyway, that, this was really cool because the idea was, remember that, that boardroom table of all the, the people around that boardroom table and how you give one, you know, each one a cookie? Well, one of the cookies that we were able to give was to the logistics people because during SARS, what happened is face shields come in small, medium, and large. And uh, wouldn't it be cool if you could have one size fits all? And I said, sure, no problem. We'll do one size fits all. Because during the, the SARS crisis, they ran out of medium. Go figure, they'd run out of medium. So they had like extra smalls and extra large. Does this sound like going to any store looking at the sales racks? Um, so they, they ran out of medium. And during an outbreak, one of the problems is you, you can't exactly call the, the factory and say, hi, we need like a million face shields tomorrow. And they'll say, okay, yeah, get in line because so does every single other person ever. So we'll ship those to you in like 18 months. Is that okay? Um, so, and that's, that's kind of what happened during the SARS crisis. Uh, so by having one size fits all, you can have a much better logistics. Uh, you know, it's much easier to handle inventory. Um, so 
this became a, a you know getting these user requirements again uh, helped the product become better. So uh, you know here's sort of that laundry list of uh, of things that that uh, we were able to improve on, and you know. Individually, none of them are particularly sexy, except you know maybe the the tuck under the chin thing. But you know, all in all, they they came together um, to uh, to create this this better product. And you know, marketing geniuses that we were when we tried to figure out a name for this better shield. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So better anti fog. Okay. So here, let me uh, let me see if. Okay, so this was the clinical trial. Uh, this is one of the clinical trials. So the, the clinical trial was made with, uh, we, we supplied prototypes before we went into production, but these were like absolutely um, accurate. Let me see if I can replay that. Okay, yeah. Ding, ding. Okay, so two face shields, 12 week trial. And this happened at a few different facilities. And the result of this trial, of these trials, would turn into a purchase order. For us, so we had to be not only better than what existed, but we had to be like a lot better. I forget what it, we had to be like two or three times better on a qualitative scale, which is kind of a funky thing. But um, so uh, the trial itself was was kind of fun and funny because um, so prototypes can be really expensive, and prototypes of disposable objects are funny because. Each of these prototypes cost, you know, uh, like they're hand built by artisans uh, to look exactly like a throwaway disposable few penny thing. Uh, and so we had hundreds of these prototypes built. And, you know, I personally built a lot of them and my colleagues built a whole bunch. And, you know, but we didn't tell the clinicians that they were prototypes. Uh, so they... Um, you know, they're using them, they, they put them on for the trial, and then they, they use them for a few minutes, do a patient, and then, like, throw them away. And it's like, every one that they're throwing away is, like, $100, $100. So, which is another reason that it was good that I was out of town. Um, so, and then, uh, you know, as I was mentioning, you, you give a cookie to each person around that table. You, you give something to green light that, uh, that stakeholder table. So... Another one was the logistics people were really complainy about uh, how big storage was uh, on existing face shields. So we figured out a way to compress it to one quarter of the size, which if you're buying a pandemic stockpile, by the way, a pandemic stockpile means like you're filling a warehouse with these for the day when the zombies come or SARS-2 or whatever it is. Um, so there are like lots of these in warehouses across the country now. Uh, so, and when you have lots and lots of them, then size kind of matters for, uh, for the storage. Um, and then I mentioned the penny less, even though that's a quarter. So that's like 25 units of worth of less. Um, so anyway, that's a, that's a kind of example of um, how we were able to engage our users, uh, engage, engage our potential customers to get the real user requirements that were really important to them. And uh, so the, the product, by the way, was a really big success. Uh, it is now, uh, you know, across the country, it's in hospitals all over, it's used uh, in a number of different countries. And that, that actual product line has been licensed out. And so at this point, I just kind of receive a nice check uh, every, every few weeks and pick that up and that's like free and clear. So that's, uh, that's kind of that. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's, that's basically what I wanted to talk to you about today of, um, you know, some various ways of getting user feedback, getting user input versus not and, and the perils that that can, uh, that can give. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. I guess we're going to all open up to questions. Yes. Your first um, entrepreneurial failure sort of dissuade other people from trusting you to, to do another project later on, or how did you have to deal with that? Ah, so how, um, the, the narrative. Um, 
Well, one of the, so it, it's kind of funny because um, if you, if you look through the, like if you Google it, um, it's all success. It's actually not that widely known that it was an utter failure. Um, it's, you know, things like this are, are fairly rare. Like if you, if you Google it, you'll see the awards, you'll see the Dragon's Den, you'll see newspaper articles around the world. I was even on MTV. Uh, like, it's, it's true. Um, so that's, that's what you'll find. So it, is, it hasn't been like really widely known, but the way that I've figured it out, because it was it, like, I had a lot personally invested in this, you, you know, not, not just money, but like, you know, a lot of my own time and my own efforts um, is, uh, you know, I've, I've come to terms with it. I've learned from the mistakes. Every problem is an opportunity. Um, every problem is an opportunity. So my, my question was, what was my opportunity going to be from, from this mistake? And the, the best opportunity I could have hoped for is learning from them. And so I, I learned a lot and I'm very happy to talk about the mistakes that I've made uh, and what I learned from them and how I was able to apply them and kind of fix them in the, in the future. Anybody else? Any, uh, any other questions? Um, so what I, oh yeah, I'm sorry, go on. How's this business going? Uh, which one, the, uh, the face shield business? Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's autopilot. Uh, I, um, I found that I, I really like to design things and invent things. And when I had my own company, um, I would, it, it was a funny thing. I had to come up with policies on everything. Like what's my janitor policy in my company? What's my um, like parking policy? Uh, you know, how do I deal with WSIB? Uh, so there was so much boring stuff with what I was doing that I, I thought that by having my own company as a designer and an inventor, I'd be able to design and invent all the time. And that turned out to actually be inaccurate. Um, really inaccurate. And I, I wound up having to like hire designers and hire uh, other people to, to do that for me. And that, that really kind of burned me for a while. Um, but uh, so now, now what I do is I, I license out my technologies. I let other companies uh, basically do the marketing and sales and uh, regulatory work and, you know, like the, the stuff that is really boring to me. I love kind of big picture, uh, you know, getting into the, getting into the details, but, uh, but the, the technical stuff, I, I really enjoy that. And I let other companies do what they're strong at and I just license. Uh, and that, that's worked really nicely. Um, you know, and then sometimes companies bring me on for some time to develop really complicated products. So I, I didn't talk to you today about a, a, a big product that I've been working on, which is a, a infectious disease diagnostics. Uh, project and that one is a much bigger team and the requirements gathering is a lot more formalized than what I showed here today and so I you know if we had like another I would say a solid hour I'd give you another presentation about that with a uh, traceability of requirements through to you know uh, requirements uh, detailed design testing, you know, traceability, all of this kind of thing. So there are a lot more formalized methods to do what I'm showing you. This is informal and it's more market-based what I showed you today. And that's appropriate for these scale of products. Uh, for much more complicated products where you're going to have a team, you'll actually do this in kind of a, uh, like an ISO 13485 regulated methodology and that as appropriate. Yeah? Just curious, how does the anti <clears throat> Fog more. Ah, I now know a lot about fog. <laughs> uh, so um, fog is really cool, and I'll, I'll just tell you this. Uh, when you breathe out, um, there is the same amount of liquid. That is, so you, you, your, your breath has a, a liquid vapor, and it just sticks to the inside of you know, your glasses or your face shield or whatever. And microscopically what's happening is the water uh, goes onto the surface and creates little water bubbles, little, uh, little basically water droplets. And fog is simply 100 zillion little microscopic water droplets. And if you look at the droplets, they're, they're right next to each other but they're not playing nicely together. They're, they're just near each other. All antifog does is it changes the surface tension to the solid, to the, to the uh, surface. So the water droplet, instead of looking like this, when it hits the surface, it kind of goes like this. And then because it's so close to its neighbor, 
they, they, the two drops form one bigger drop. And then those two drops form one bigger, 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 bigger drop. And so, in fact, you have just this one enormous water droplet instead of a zillion little ones. And that's why you can see through it. So all we've done is change the surface chemistry on the, on the face shield itself. Um, so it, it doesn't really change what's happening in your glasses because I'm going to bet that you've had glasses issues. So that's a problem that you have with your glasses and the anti-fog of your glasses, which I can't really help too much. Okay. Any other uh, questions? I just have a comment, uh, just a thought that um, one of the, I think, key learning lessons uh, from the case study that uh, you are uh, presenting to me, what Shahira Bimani uh, uh, has highlighted in her last lecture when, when she said that uh, many of our innovations fail at the health technology assessment level. I think she mentioned 50 to 95 percent, just because our innovators do not really take into account the feedback of the end users of the technology. And uh, the case study really reinforces this fact when it's very important to really take uh, the perspective of the hospital administrators, the physicians, the clinicians, the, the nursing staff, the allied healthcare personnel, everyone, and really take a deep dive into that uh, before spending time, money, and effort uh, in the development process. Um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Gilad, for Thank you, it's my pleasure. pleasure.